behalf of the Charles S. Murphy Center for American Government, the Living History Program at Duke, and the Harry S. Truman Library Institute, it's my privilege to welcome to this interview the Honorable George McGee, who among other roles has been uh, an ambassador to Turkey, an assistant secretary of state, an undersecretary of state, and an ambassador to Germany. Participating with me in this interview is Malcolm Gillis, a professor of public policy and economics. I am Bruce Cunningham, the director of the Institute of Public Policy and a professor of history and public policy. Ambassador McGee, uh, our focus is going to be on your career in public service, but before getting to that career, I'm wondering if you could look briefly back at your past growing up in Texas and going to school in Oklahoma and seeing if you can uh, remember which issues or which uh, events occurred to, in your life that were, had some kind of bearing on your future uh, role in public service. What, what was important in your past? That was very interesting. <clears throat> I perhaps never thought about that uh, in the way you put it. <clears throat> As a young lad, I was very interested in geology. I went out and over the fields and picked up fossils and identified them. And later, this led me to become a, an oil geologist. And curiously enough, uh, when I was Assistant Secretary of State, it became invaluable because I was the only person dealing with the Anglo-Iranian oil crisis and with the 50-50 agreement in Saudi Arabia who really knew anything about the oil business. Then it gave me quite an advantage over the British representatives that I dealt with and uh, with the company people that I dealt with. Do you remember uh, when you finished, I guess, Phi Beta Kappa at the University of Oklahoma and, and I presume you went subsequently to Oxford when you applied for your Rhodes Scholarship and got it, uh, what the gist of your interview was when they asked you what you were going to do with your life, what you were going to study? Yes, by this time I had changed my perspective somewhat and <clears throat> I admitted to the committee who was investigating me that I had started out in life already. I had, had become a, a practicing geologist, had worked two years for oil companies, <clears throat> that I intended to pursue this and uh, so I could uh, get, make sufficient means to go into public life. Uh, I already had this as my goal. I didn't know how long it would take, and fortunately it didn't take very long. What from your experience at Oxford stayed with you out of that whole experience? You went all the way through for a doctorate. Well, my interest in, in Oxford turned more towards political things, which I knew no, had known nothing about before. Uh, art, uh, philosophy, and uh, uh, history. I spent most of my time reading generally in these fields. My own research uh, I did alone and I, I could govern my timing any, any way I chose. And so I tried to read broadly and attend the lectures that were being given there. Uh, there were a great many distinguished physicists who came there, Arthur Holly Compton, uh, Schrodinger, and there were a great many uh, people like G.D.H. Cole and Sir Alfred Zimmern who were making speeches there in current political affairs. I, I sought to broaden the base of my education. And then uh, shortly after graduating from Oxford, I guess uh, you found that the war had broken out, what, two, two years later or thereabouts? And uh, you worked for a number of uh, civilian agencies, but what, the War Production Board and a number of others. And then you were in the military, I guess, with a bomber command under Curtis LeMay. Uh, were there any experiences there that stood out in your mind that you remember vividly? Well, I remember vividly my being with LeMay the evening we bombed Tokyo when LeMay brought the B-29s down from 32,000 feet to 5,000 feet at night and bombed Tokyo with incendiary bombs. Uh, I was sitting next to LeMay and he was getting the in-flight messages and all the 125 planes got over the target, they all hit the target, they saw big fires, they got away. It took two days because of the smoke to get the, uh, an estimate of the damage that had been done and we were appalled to see that we had burned down 42 square miles, the area of Manhattan Island and later we learned had killed 150,000 people. Huh. The, uh, after your 
tour in the military, uh, you went to work for Will Clayton, I guess, in about 1946. Uh, what was the genesis of that relationship? How did you wind up working for this distinguished? Well, Will Clayton was a man I greatly admired. I'd known him in Houston, and I came up before I went in the Navy and worked in the War Production Board. At the time, he was head of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. He was buying raw materials, and I was participating in the acquisition of the raw materials needed for the war effort. And I admired him so much that I wanted to work with him. And at the same time, when I got out of the Navy, I wanted to join the State Department. So I applied and got a position in his office at the lowest level. Uh, I remember Fisher Ames and I shared a, an office together. Uh, and I managed to work directly for Clayton for some two to two to three years. And after that, uh, you went to the Greek-Turkish aid program and then subsequently got appointed Assistant Secretary of State for Near East and African Affairs. Uh, the basis of those appointments by Harry Truman was what, your connection with Will Clayton initially and then the good job that you'd done with the Greek-Turkish aid program? Well, I had... No one had uh, figured out how you administered the Greek Turkish aid. Uh, I didn't participate in the making of the policy, but once we had the money from Congress, someone had to devise how it should be run. Uh, the State Department had never done anything like this before. We were responsible for administering the program. So I had set up an interdepartmental inter committee with all the agencies of government who could contribute to the program, agriculture, treasury, commerce, and I had become so enmeshed in it that when it came time to appoint what they call the coordinator for aid to Greece and Turkey under the law, uh, they appointed me. I was about 35 years old, and it was a quite an important job for a young man. And, and then you became the Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, what background did you have, if any, in the Near East other than dealing with Greece and Turkey at this time? Well. When the Greek-Turkish pro program was just about over, Dean Rusk called me in one day. He was under Secretary of State then. And he said, have you ever heard of the Arab refugee problem? And I said, frankly, no, I've been so engrossed with Greece and Turkey. This was in the aftermath of the 38 war. Well, he said, you better learn because this is the key to peace or war in the Middle East. And the Secretary wants to send somebody out there. and. Uh, I'd like to offer you the position of minister, which I had never been offered before, and uh, assistance to the secretary for Arab refugees. Oh, I said, Dean, no. I've had so much trouble working with the Greeks and the Turks. I don't want to really get into the Middle East. Well, he said, you better do this. Your job is about over, and if you want to stick around at your level here, I recommend you do this. So I did, and that's how I became a a Middle Eastern. Just a brief question to begin with. Uh, did you know George Allen, who was also a trustee? Very and a well, indeed. He was a contemporary man. I probably. live in the house that George built in Bahama. I'm sure George would have built a nice house. He did. He did. Uh, as you know better than anyone else, Mr. Ambassador, the, the Arabian American Oil Company, uh, Aramco, for a long time had, a, had an oil concession in Saudi Arabia that uh, prohibited income taxes. So, Mr. Ambassador, could you reflect on your role in the chain of events leading to the 1950 watershed change in the terms of the Aramco concession, wherein Saudi oil profits were split 50-50 thereafter between the Saudi government and Aramco? This was known by some as the McGee bombshell. <laughs> uh, specifically, why did the State Department, through you, take the lead in encouraging this change, and why was it done when it was done? Well, the reasons were very clear. The Saudis weren't making enough money, really, from their oil. Their income was pitifully small. They received only a, a royalty, not a share of profit. And they kept threatening that if they didn't get more, that they were going to look, look for somebody else, and that they might cancel the concession of the Aramco people. The, the Aramco officials, were thoroughly sympathetic to the idea of, of giving more. They knew the problem. And uh, however, their parents, the major oil companies, uh, thought that they were uh, being too soft with the Saudi. We were convinced that they had to give more. And we didn't want to be responsible for telling them that or how much to give. 
So we organized a series of meetings. We had a meeting with the Ramco officials, and they were thoroughly in sympathy with this idea. So they brought the parents down. And uh, I asked our political officers to describe Ibn Saud's problems. Uh, I had visited Ibn Saud the year before and knew somewhat of these problems and had gotten some arms from him. He was afraid of the British and the Hashemite. But after the parents heard how difficult their situation was there, uh, they all agreed with Aramco that they should move to the 50-50. Uh, originally, they didn't say what the precise amount would be, and we let them reach this conclusion. Only one company, I think, that was a holdout at that time, and uh, they came in very quickly after Must have been Gulf. Gulf. And uh, they were the most eager of all to, to get this accomplished after they finally made up their mind. But the decision to, to offer the 50-50 was really made in my office in the State Department. You were worried you and the State Department were worried uh, quite a bit about the, the prospects of a cutoff of Saudi oil at the time of the Korean War, as I recall. Well, that was later, I believe. Uh, the, the, this, this was coming close. Th this was uh, in '51, uh, I believe right. it was. When, well, you, you spoke of the tax aspect. We didn't consider that. That was Treasury's problem, and. Uh, the decision that Treasury made in this regard was perfectly logical uh, decision. The, if you, if you uh, uh, seek the analogy between oil production in our country, the corporate tax at that time was about 50 percent. And uh, the 50-50 sharing of profits um, is about the same, precisely the same. And if you avoid double taxation, uh, if they pay the 50 percent, it's in a sense a foreign tax, yeah. and uh, it's the same as in the States, so it's quite fair. And the Treasury Department so considered this, it, it never really uh, uh, had any trouble making the decision that the 50-50 should have been uh, in lieu of, of, of tax. Mr. Ambassador, among the many leaders of African and Asian nations that you and knew well were Mossadegh and, and King Ibn Saud, but you must have also met uh, personages such as Kwame Nkrumah and Nehru and Haile Selassie. Did you know any of these men well enough to form any impressions you might care to share with us? Yes, I knew them all sufficiently well. I made a trip of Af all around Africa. Africa came in my area of jurisdiction. And uh, interesting enough, I, I had several meetings with Milan in what was then the Union of South Africa, just after he had come in on the basis of his apartheid policy. In the same trip, I uh, uh, visited Ethiopia, and Haile Selassie gave a, a dinner for me. I recall we were, had formal evening dress, and I only had a, a white uh, evening coat, which they didn't wear. Everyone else was in black. And, I always recall coming into the entrance of his palace, two lions in cages on either side as you went in. Uh, it was a very interesting evening, and at a particular time, I was called up to have a tete-a-tete with Haile Selassie after dinner. And we talked for a long time, and he was very agreeable. As when I left, I looked, and he was talking now to somebody else, just as agreeably. And uh, I asked who that was, and they told me it was the Russian ambassador. <laughs> in Kruma, I met later. Uh, he came to America on a, an official visit at our request, and I gave a luncheon for him at the Metropolitan Club. He, um, had, at that time, was called the leader of government business. The British had given him this position, which was the highest position any black uh, had ever been given in a government in Africa. And uh, he didn't really have policy-making powers, but he, he, he was relatively important in, in the uh, parliament there in, in the, the Ivory Coast. And I gave a, a little toast to him, which is in my book, in which I applauded the British for giving him such responsibilities 
showing that the British was making reasonable efforts to bring self-government into Africa, and that we hoped this would presage other moves of this type by the British. He was a very attractive man, and of course one couldn't anticipate that, I'm afraid success turned his head and he squandered his nation, nation's resources and ended up in ignominy. Yes, that's true. Unfortunately, Ghana, uh, the, the per capita income of Ghana in constant dollars today is below what it was in 1955. They had cocoa beans and um, had a good market for them. What about Nehru? Well, Nehru is an enigma, really. I, I must say, I don't think I ever understood Nehru. He, Nehru is very popular among certain people. Uh, however, when you analyze what it is he says, it's always so vague, you can't, can't quite pin him down. I uh, remember I had arranged his visit to America, which was not very successful because he insisted on going over the heads of our government. He and Truman didn't get along. Uh, he was angry, I think, because Truman and Barclay and the dinner uh, the, the president gave talk mainly about the, the virtues of bourbon whiskey. And uh, he went over his head to the intellectuals of America. Uh, as, as a result, he was very unpopular in America. And uh, we had great difficulty getting the uh, money from Congress for the grain for India, you recall, when they had a bad fa famine in, in India because of his unpopularity. I visited India and as Assistant Secretary of State and had an interview with Nehru. I had my talking points and a little piece of paper. And, uh, he asked me to talk first, so I went through my points and gave him our opinion of various things and asked him questions about various things. Uh, in reply, he said, well, Mr. McGee, I'm sure you'd like me to be very candid with you, and I will. Where he, he, upon he went into a, a form of double talk for about a half hour. Uh, mentally, I was taking down notes to put in the telegram. In the end, there was nothing to put. It was all so vague and evasive. I think the Indians had been colonists so long that they knew how to avoid being explicit. The relationship between he and Lord Mountbatten was quite strange, was it not? Well, the relationship was between not Batten and his wife. <laughs> That's true, too. I mean, between Nehru and yes. getting out Batten's wife. We, at, at this particular visit, she had just left. And uh, at a luncheon Nehru gave, uh, the discussion was all about her. Uh, and she visited Nehru periodically over this period. He and, he and Matt Batten got along very well in working out the division of India. And uh, Did Mount Batten know about all this? Oh, everyone did. Uh, mm -hmm. so. By 1949, Iranian American Oil Company was the third largest crude oil producer in the world. But in April 1951, as you well know, uh, Mohammad Mossadegh was chosen prime minister and within a month uh, issued a decree nationalizing the oil industry. Uh, uh, well, nationalizing Anglo-Iranian. This, of course, enraged Britain, and Dean Acheson sent Abel Harriman out as a special envoy to mediate between Britain and Iran. Could you comment on your perception of Harriman's role uh, at that time and leading up to the death of Mossadegh? Yes, I <clears throat> participated in the meetings that led to the decision to send Harriman out, and, and I urged this because uh, the British were at an impasse and they asked us to help, and Harriman is one of our uh, ablest negotiators. And he took out with him Walter Levy, the greatest oh, yes. oil expert we had, Bill Roundtree, who was a great expert on the Middle East, and Vernon Walters, our present ambassador to Germany, as his interpreter. And I imagine that Avril stayed out six weeks, two months, totally, during his, his uh, stay there. And he and Rosa Day went round and round, over and over, and never made any, any real progress. Uh, Averill wasn't used to not succeeding, and it really chafed him that they couldn't reach a, a conclusion. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, nothing happened as a result of it. We're going to, can I just ask one more? Uh, we're, in a couple of months, we're going to be interviewing Walter Davis, mm -hmm. who was, uh, w worked under uh, uh, 
uh, at Occidental Petroleum on Arm and Hammer, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to develop a profile of oil company executives at that time. I believe the the chief executive officer of uh, Anglo-Iranian at the time was a Scotsman by the name of Fraser. Yes, Sir William Fraser, and later Lord Strathallan. And uh, <laughs> did you know him well? <laughs> well, I knew uh, I knew him very well, but not. I only had one personal contact yeah. with him when I came through London. Uh, Lord Sherfield, uh, Roger Makins, now Lord Sherfield, had us to lunch, and he knew that I had been criticizing him, and he he he, he was very much on the defensive. And very, very uncommunicative and mm -hmm. very uncooperative. But I had my chance at Moser Day later when he came to America, mm -hmm. uh, which he did in order to attend the uh, meetings of the United Nations and make his pitch for Iran. And uh, we hadn't invited him, and this rather surprised us, but the British agreed that we could try to get a deal with him. And so over a period of about three weeks, I had 80 hours of conversations with him. With most of it. Always <laughs> sitting on his bed, he in his bed, either in New York or in Washington in his hotel or in the Walter Reed Hospital. And he spent one day at my farm in Middleburg. And Dean Atchison participated in some of these meetings. Paul Nitzer participated in some. And we all thought we had a deal. Uh, the details are in my book, but uh, one, one very dramatic evening in New York, he gave me back the Abadan refinery. Uh, the world had assumed that he had, he had nationalized the Abadan refinery, and, and all of a sudden he said, no, we haven't nationalized it. And uh, it's the biggest refinery in the world, so it's rather an important matter. So we, I got two pieces of paper, and uh, uh, Vernon Walters wrote in French, Iran has not nationalized the Abadan refinery, which he signed. And uh, I wrote one out in English to give to him, which he signed. <laughs> and he kept the one in French and I kept the one in English. And that night, Vernon Walters and I really went out of the tower. We thought we had won. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to play out a little bit more the the Iranian uh, question here, and that is that uh, you may remember that Dean Acheson characterized uh, British policy during this time as persistently stupid. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, you know, you'd had a 50-50 sharing arrangement worked out in Saudi Arabia, and somehow the British weren't able to come to grips with the Iranians, even with our uh, intermediation. Mm -hmm. At the time, you spent a lot of time trying to work that out, think through the process. What was your sense of what the problem was with the British? Was it simply an old colonial mentality? Was it something more avaricious? Well, it's, it's complicated. After this meeting I had with the Aramco parents, uh, I went to London to tell the Foreign Office and Aramco that they were going to have to give, and I mentioned something big. I didn't say precisely 50%, but I said, your gas gals, gals Girls on agreement will be outdated, so you you must move, and uh, this is going to happen very very soon. And the Foreign Office uh, accepted this and asked me to come and speak to the board of the Anglo Iranian Oil Company. Um, Fraser was away hunting in Scotland. Well, I think uh, the book you have there says that he was deliberately away. I don't know. Gas was the ranking man at the lunch. And the, uh, the British assistant secretary that had brought me there said, all right, now you tell the anglo just what you told us. And so I told them. And they drew back and they said, in a sense, you mind your own business. We know Iran much better than you. You give them an inch and they'll take a mile. We're the best oil company. Our housing in, in, for English people in Iran is the best in the Middle East, and uh, they, in a sense, refused to pay any attention. And it was not long after that the, Anglo the uh, uh, Aramco announced the 50-50, and not long after that, that uh, 
the, the, the uh, Raz Marah, the new prime minister of Iran, was shot, and the properties were nationalized. In, in retrospect, uh, if we could have done it over again, do you think the Truman administration sh should have simply taken a tougher line in Iran, or was it difficult to do, given the fact that we needed the Brits there because of our containment policy? Well, Britain was our closest ally at that time, and they were in a precarious position. Uh, we couldn't assume responsibility for getting them eliminated from Iran. Um, the loss to them would have been so tremendous, and the reaction against us would have been very great. Uh, everyone understands that it was the, the, the obdurateness of, of Sir William Frazier. Uh, he, was, he, he was an accountant. His family had a small oil, oil shale firm. And over a period of time, he had come into the uh, uh, executive branch of Anglo Iranian. He gradually got to the top. But he didn't know much about the oil business, really, and, and was very stubborn and very, very tight in releasing any of the vast f sums that he, Anglo Iranian, was making out of Saudi Arabia. When we started, the income in Saudi Arabia was $30 million a year. They say that wasn't enough to cover the, the, the defense of the area, which they, they had to provide for Anglo Iranian. And the, uh, they, they were just too slow in moving to be generous with the Iranians and ward off this nationalization. And I, I don't think we could have done more than we did. As you know, I came under great attack from the British for, for, for what I did. If we would moved any, any further, <laughs> we probably had to break relations with England. Um, could you discuss briefly your uh, interactions with and assessments of the Shah? Yes, I first met the Shah when he made his first visit to America. He was quite a young man then, relatively inexperienced, uh, quite an attractive young man. He had grandiose ideas of having a big army that uh, could, could fight the Russians in the mountains of Iran. And uh, we didn't want to give it to him because we thought it was a waste and that he couldn't afford it. He, he didn't have much of an oil income at that time. But I took him and he made his presentation to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And they, they were polite with him, but after he left, they thought his plans were, were too grandiose. And so we didn't give him any arms aid at that time. But he made a good impression at that time. And had, it was quite different from the way he, he later became, because his power was so absolute in that country that he gradually became a complete autocrat. He never listened to anyone. And he, he was so domineering that uh, he really had control over our own officials. They were afraid of him. And in the end, Nixon was giving him everything he wanted. And uh, Kissinger uh, uh, wanted to help build him up at any cost to be the leading power in the Middle East on his theory of geopolitics, that you control an area by finding a strong point like the Shah, put everything in him. Unfortunately, we got caught with uh, no contacts with the rest of the Iranian people. <coughs> and when the Shah was overthrown, uh, we had no way to return, with it, particularly since, since we had uh, helped overthrow most of the day. Uh, we became the great Satan. Um, do you have Could I, just continuing, uh, as, as we try to uh, put together a picture of the personalities and lives of, of all company executives, did, did you have a personal acquaintance with Armand Hammer? No, no. I've met Armand Hammer socially in Washington, but I never had any business relations with him. Uh, you, I know that you're a collector of some Indonesian artifacts, but your visits to Indonesia were well after your career in the Mideast. Was Did it have to do with the oil business? Or? Yes, I happened. I was on the board of Mobile at that stage, and I came through Indonesia on the way to a, a, um, a Mobile board meeting in Canberra. Mm -hmm. The great Minas field is still producing 700,000 barrels a day, mm -hmm. even though it was supposed to peter out 10 years ago. 
No, the, the, the great oil fields and gas fields, mainly gas in the Indonesia. Uh, I'm wondering if I can uh, talk a little bit with you about Turkey, yes, a subject that we've both been interested in. Uh, I guess your first uh, uh, interaction with Turkey as a public servant was in the Greek Turkish aid program, is that correct? That's right. I visited there. I was never stationed there, of course. But. I see. And so your first visits were when, around 1948? Or Thereabouts. Right. Mm -hmm. And what was the process that led you to be appointed ambassador uh, to Turkey? Well, I had become Assistant Secretary of State after coordinating the program of aid to Greece and Turkey, and I wanted my own mission, and I was rather in, in a good position to influence being given Turkey. It became available. Mm -hmm. uh, ambassador Wadsworth was being transferred as a result of a routine change, and uh, I asked for Turkey. When was it that uh, you began to play an important role uh, in, in Turkey's accession to NATO? My sense has always been that when you were an assistant secretary is when your role was instrumental. Uh, there was some point at which you must have been convinced that uh, it needed to become mm -hmm. a member of the emerging alliance. Well, when the alliance was formed, uh, Turkey and many other countries wanted to join, but we explained to them that this was an Atlantic alliance and that uh, the North European countries uh, wouldn't consider it the same alliance if they joined it up with the Middle East. However, as the, the formation of NATO proceeded, uh, Italy came in, North Africa, French North Africa came in, so it was getting pretty close, and so Turkey either they needed our protection. They, they were very threatened by the Soviet Union. They have a big border with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had always wanted to, <coughs> to gain control of the Straits area and it threatened the Turks in to, to help fortify the Straits area. Um, for a very long time, the Turks put pressure on us either to let them in the NATO or to create a similar organization in the Middle East. And that was not possible because we hadn't really uh, been able to give NATO the strength that we wanted to. We didn't have the resources left over to arm the Middle East. We wanted the British to take care of that as long as possible. Gradually, this pressure built up. And it, it appeared to me that it was going to be inevitable that either we give Turkey a guarantee or, or Turkey may go neutral or veer toward the Arab countries and turn their back on, on Europe. And uh, the key meeting at which this was finally recommended to the department was a meeting of all of our ambassadors in the Middle East in Istanbul. And Admiral Carney, who was the Southeast NATO command, and uh, Tom Fenletter, who's Secretary of the Air Force, were at these meetings. I'd invited them for the discussion of this, this uh, uh, idea of getting Greece and Turkey into NATO. And the ambassadors were so convinced that if we didn't make an offer, that we may lose these countries and thereby lose any hope of defending the Middle East, that we sent a very strong telegram to Washington recommending that we, we ask NATO now to admit Greece and Turkey. Do you remember any of the negotiations you participated in with the Joint Chiefs at this time? Yes, I, I met a number of times with the Joint Chiefs. Uh, some of the Joint Chiefs leaned toward Tur Greece and Turkey's accessions at that time. Uh, the, one, the one who opposed it was Joseph Collins, who's General Collins I admire very much. And his reasoning was, uh, what I've just stated, that they hadn't really been able to give NATO the military substance that they needed in order to protect Europe, which had a number one priority. Uh, until they did that, they couldn't uh, make, make commitments in the Middle East. And it was some time later and after the meeting in Istanbul that we finally made the decision. Do you think that your sort of independence as, a, as an oil man, if we can call you that, 
uh, gave you uh, a certain amount of clout with the State Department because you weren't beholden to the bureaucracy. You could go wade in with the Joint Chiefs and make your case. Uh, did that distinguish you from other public servants? Oh, I, I don't think so, really. Uh, George Allen would have done the same thing. I don't think the, the um, career officers uh, lacked in confidence and uh, ability to stand up for their principles. It, it, it may have been made life a little easier for me. They didn't always take on the British quite the way you did. Well, I was such a great Anglophile. <laughs> that I was really trying to save British despite themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I regretted very much that I came in conflict with the British. Uh, but I honestly thought that Frazier was handling it so badly that unless we, we put pressure on the British, that they were going to lose Iran. Uh, while we're still on Turkey, I was wondering if you could give us some uh, observations of some of the Turkish leaders, in particular uh, Inunu, Bayar, and Menderes. Mm -hmm. Well, when I, when I first came there as uh, uh, Minister of Greek Turkish Aid, Inunu was the Prime Minister. Inunu was uh, a tricky fellow. You never, never knew where you stood with him, and he would do unpredictable things. A troublemaker, really, from from my viewpoint and our viewpoint. Uh, before, when I was assistant secretary of state, Bayer had become president. He had been head of the largest bank in Turkey. He had been uh, the man Ataturk had chosen to head the, the Democratic Party, the opposition party that Ataturk created against himself. He was a magnificent man. His foreign minister, Kupalu, was the greatest Turkish historian on the Middle East. And when I came then as ambassador, I, I had most of my discussions with uh, Kupalu and with Mendes, who was the prime minister. And many, many of my meetings were with the two of them together. And one time, I was called to meet with those two and Bayer all together in Ataturk's farm out near Ankara. And uh, to my surprise, Bayer said that they had made the decision that they wanted to denationalize oil production. No one had ever done this. <laughs> they wanted to invite the foreign companies in, and they wanted me to tell them how to do it. And so I did. And it took about a year before they finally got a good oil law, but a dozen companies came in and spent $100 million and found quite a lot of oil. Uh, what were your impressions of uh, Menderes and Zorlu? Well, I liked Mendes, working with Menderes very much. He was, he was a very... Uh, intelligent and alert uh, individual, easy to deal with, and make, make, he could make up his mind very quickly and was very, very outspoken. Um, I think he deserved better than he got. He, I think as, as far as the Turks are concerned, he had become fairly autocratic in the end. He had this curious accident in London where he was in an airplane that crashed, and it was a miracle that he survived. And I think he thought that this gave him some superior quality of almost being invulnerable. And uh, he antagonized the press and others, and this led to his demise. But uh, he was a very good man for us to deal with. Zorro was a very able man, but he was rather difficult to deal with. He was an arrogant man and he treated his superior inferiors and our lower officers rather, rather rudely. Now, did, uh, I'm not sure, did you have any official uh, interactions with Turkey uh, after leaving there as ambassador? Well, of course, when I became undersecretary for political affairs, I dealt with all of the countries. And I had one experience when I was head of policy planning, which was my first job when I came back with Dean Rusk. Uh, we, uh, we're meeting every morning, Dean Ross, George Ball, and I to plan the day's business. And I had a telegram on my desk saying that the Revolutionary Council had sentenced to death 14 members of the Turkish government as a result of the coup of the colonels. 
and this included all the people we've been discussing and more. Uh, it was very easy to convince Dean Rusk that we had to do something about it. He picked the phone up and got Kennedy on the line, and it only took a few minutes to persuade Kennedy. And Kennedy said, go as far as you like in, in telling the Turks that this will very severely damage our, rec our relations and harm, make it difficult for us to be as generous as aid and anything you want. And so I got a telephone and put through a call to Ray Hare, our ambassador there, who been my deputy. Uh, I, I got two times the wrong number in a Munich uh, officer's club, I remember. When I finally got Ray, I told him what had happened and said we wanted him to go and, and tell the Turkish government that. And he didn't say anything at all. I, Ray, did you hear me? Yes, I heard you. I'm going right now to see the council. And he was the first person who was able to get to the council to try to save these people. And in the end, I think we contributed quite a lot to saving 11 of them. Three of them were, as you know, executed, Mendes and Zorlu and Polak Town, the finance minister. We didn't manage to save them. Uh, what about uh, some of Turkey's more recent leaders like uh, Ecevit, and Demirel, and Özal? Well, Ecevit and Demirel were perennial prime ministers. They would alternate being prime minister. They were quite different people. Echevit was a poet, and a rather vague individual and not a good executive from my experience with him. Uh, Demo was a more pragmatic man, practical man, but he didn't seem to be a very good executive either. And Turkey didn't have good governments under this rotating Demoral Echevit. Uh, series of governments. Also, I didn't deal with, of course, as an official of our government, but uh, since we have a home in Turkey and I go every year, and I, I see him frequently there and when he visits Washington. He's a very able man and very experienced. He worked for the World Bank and is, is a, a trained economist and speaks perfect English. Uh, unfortunately, he has sort of lost popularity in Turkey and is now president, uh, not prime minister, but he took with him to the presidency the powers he had as prime minister by, by some reason. He, uh, if he went to the polls today, people don't think he would have more than 25% support of the people. But he has enough deputies left over from the era when he was more popular so that he can't be removed for another two years, I think the period is. So he has two years in order to rule. His greatest problem is that he's not been able to overcome inflation. And this is the main thing I think that people hold against him. Uh, inflation is caused basically by overspending, resulting in large public deficits and spending somewhat for political reasons to uh, obtain votes for his party uh, in the area where he's building dams and helping people in economic projects. As you, as you reflect on your years uh, working in public service with particular focus on the Middle East, as you look back on your experience, were there any particular uh, triumphs that you felt you personally had or perhaps failures? things that you might have done differently? Yes. I, I feel very good about getting Greece and Turkey in the NATO. I, I, I think played the most important role in our government in achieving that. And I'm convinced that this is what locked the door of the Middle East to the Soviets. If we hadn't done that, the Soviets could have moved in and taken it. As you recall, the, your book, you, you have a map which shows the thrust that the, the Soviets made to within 18 miles of Tehran and that they made into Greece the guerrillas from Bulgaria and Yugoslavia. And there's no question that the, that the Soviets had in mind taking the Middle East by force. And once Turkey and Greece came into NATO, this was stopped. 
that that I think is, is, is it was a, a turning point in in the history of that part of the world. Right. See, I agree with you. I think that that it was a success and it was easy. What about things you might have done better? Well, one thing I I greatly regret that I wasn't able to solve the Arab refugee problem. Um, that was my first assignment after Greek Turkish aid, and. At that time, there were 800,000 refugees. I think if Israel had taken a couple hundred thousand more at that time, that would have appeased the Arabs. And we put that up to the Israelis, and they turned it down. And I got, I thought, the approval of our government to block an export-import bank loan. It was a $100 million loan, and they'd drawn a half of it. But to hold it up, until they took 200,000 refugees. And I, it's in my book, the, the fact that I asked the Israeli ambassador to lunch with me to tell him this. And I did it as tactfully as I could, but very clearly that we were going to hold up the export import bank loan. He looked me square in the eye and he said, you won't get by with this, I'll beat you. I got back to my office and within a half hour I had a call from the president's, President Truman's office saying the president wished to dissociate himself from blocking the Anglo the export import bank loan. And the chance then of getting Israel to take the 200,000, which I think would have almost solved the refugee problem, was lost. Huh. Uh, I guess we have a few minutes left. I'd like to ask you to discuss uh, your relationships with the presidents that you've interacted with, particularly President Truman and President Kennedy. Well, President Truman I admired very much. I, I was a junior officer and I saw him only with Atchison. And I was often with him when Atchison would put uh, proposals to him and I watched him react. His mind worked very simply and very clearly. He wouldn't let anything get complicated. He didn't wor worry about the the reaction of, of the public, uh, his popularity. The only thing he worried about was the attitude of the Republican leaders since they controlled the Senate. And once, however, he was convinced that he could get Vandenberg to, to agree and Dean, Dean Acheson recommended he say, okay, Dean, go ahead. Uh, he, he was a, a great executive and a, a very good president. I uh, greatly admired uh, Jack Kennedy. He, he was an inspiring man to work for. He, he was a charming man, an infectious smile. And I did a lot of, of um, negotiations for him. One was Ramses Trujillo, the son of the dictator after his assassination. My uh, On another occasion, I went to the Congo and negotiated with Shambe to end his, ins his rece uh, recession from, from the, the Congolese government, get him back into the Congo. And I stayed with him a week and we negotiated every day. And both of these were done under direct instructions from Kennedy. He, he, was, a, he was a great man to work for. Did you know him uh, before he became president? No. So he appointed you an Undersecretary of State and ultimately Ambassador to Germany. Yes, because Dean Russ uh, one brought me back. I, I was in Dallas one morning, one Sunday morning, I got a call from Dean. He said, I don't know whether you've read it, but uh, they, the President just asked me to be Secretary of State. and I'd like to, for you to come up and help me get started. And, so I said, what time is it there, Dean? He didn't know what I meant. He told me the time. I said, well, it's a little late today. I'll be there in the morning. <laughs> I went up and never came back to Dallas. Did you ever have any interactions with President Eisenhower? I know you were a consultant to the National Security Council during his tenure in office. Yes, I had a little, uh, when I was ambassador in Turkey, he was uh, commander of NATO, and he made a very successful visit there. I saw quite a lot of him. I was with him in all of his meetings, and he spent considerable time in the embassy. 
Uh, he's a very attractive fellow. Uh, he, he, I remember one evening he had a very hard day. With that. Uh, a lot of people in the embassy wanted to see him, so he came and stayed very late and talked with everyone. And he took his hand to one of my sons and carried him back to Istanbul the next day in his plane. Um, when he left him, he said, now I'm going to send you a, a picture of myself when I get back to Paris. And he wrote down on a little piece of paper, if I don't send you my picture, the next time you see me, you can hit me. Because <laughs> this this captured by son. <laughs> he didn't send it. <laughs> oh, he was a very charming fellow. But uh, I served under him just for a while after he came in until I was replaced by, by uh, Avril Warren. But when I came back, he appointed me to a member of the Draper Committee, which was the committee to study the uh, economic and military aid question, the relativity of aid to the country, which lasted a couple of years, a very interesting assignment, and appointed me as a consultant to the National Security Council. How much time do we have left? About 30 seconds? Um, in, in what little time we have left, uh, one of the concerns that we have here at Duke is uh, trying to think how we can prepare people for uh, roles in public service, international affairs. Looking back on your career, what, what role do you see the universities having in educating students for that kind of uh, career? Well, as far as the preparatory education for, for foreign service, I'm for a good solid subject that they can master and gives them a, a foundation to operate on. Uh, the law is a good foundation. Uh, history is a good foundation. Economics is a good foundation. And the, the particular information that you learn, uh, you can learn from books later and from travel uh, after you have acquired the confidence that comes from mastering a, a good, solid subject. Uh, now, f apart from that, uh, I think you can do it by exposing them to leaders whom you get here and talk to them. Uh, they get insights that they wouldn't otherwise get. I think they can be helped by spending a year in Paris or London uh, with the objective of trying to understand the government of those countries and, and the, the background history of these countries. But I, I, I wouldn't waste too much time on just miscellaneous subjects of rather transitory value. The man has a great deal more intellectual confidence, I believe, if he has mastered a subject like the law or history or these other ones that I mentioned. Ambassador McGee, thank you very much. Thank you. I enjoyed being with you, Bruce. On behalf of the Charles Murphy Center for American Government and the Living History Program of Duke University, it is my privilege to chair the second half of this interview with the Honorable George Cruz McGee. Mr. McGee is at Duke as a Harry S. Truman Lecturer. George McGee was ambassador to Germany from 1963 to 1968, a period of considerable change in domestic German politics and in its relations with other countries in Western Europe and with Eastern Europe and the USSR. Our own interview will primarily focus on this period. With me on the panel today are Joel Colton, Professor of History at Duke, and Professor Conrad Yarosh, Professor of European History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm Peter Lang, Professor of Political Science at Duke University. We'll begin with Professor Colton. Ambassador McGee, would you be good enough to tell us uh, a little bit about your appointment as Ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany? Did it come as a surprise to you? How did you uh, feel you were prepared for this kind of a post? And uh, what were your initial experiences in the job? Well, um, I'll try to describe <clears throat> with uh, due modesty. I uh, had been in the State Department a very considerable time 
I had come back into the department with President Kennedy and served as head of policy planning and then Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. And uh, having had a post in the Middle East, in Turkey, I wanted to complement that with a post in Western Europe. Uh, I had, didn't have in mind any particular country. I would have enjoyed very much because I had lived in England and very close to England, being in England. But the first country that came up was Turkey. And uh, I had spoken to the sector and said that if a Western European post came up, I'd like to be considered. And he, uh, when Turkey came up, uh, obtained approval from the president and offered me Turkey, which I was happy to accept. And would, would you uh, tell us a little bit, though, about uh, <laughs> the appointment to Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany? Well, I apologize. I, I, That's what I, I, really I misstated. I said uh, uh, Turkey. No, this is this okay. is Germany. All right. Yeah. I had previously had uh, considerable experience with Germany. I, as That's as I a mean. young man, at eighteen, I had worked my way over to Europe on a cotton boat and spent considerable time in Europe. And uh, later, when I was in the University of Oxford, I spent most of my vacations in Munich. And uh, took lessons in in German, in a, in, in the, at that time, with the hope of going to Göttingen University. I studied geophysics at Oxford, and Göttingen was outstanding in that subject. But uh, as it finally in, ended up, Hitler wasn't welcoming American students in in Germany at that time, and. Uh, I received no answer to my uh, reply to my application to Göttingen to come there after my two years at Oxford. Uh, incidentally, Dean Rusk spent his third year in Germany the same way that I had intended to do it. And finally, they did accept me, but it, it was so late I had already made other arrangements. Uh, I regret that because I, I would have learned a great deal more of, of the German language. But I was very happy <clears throat> to go to Germany. I admire the Germans. Uh, I consider Germany one of my most important allies. And with 500,000 Americans in Germany, we had perhaps the largest uh, embassy in the world, mm -hmm. apart from Vietnam. And uh, Germany was a, a valuable ally. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what was the thinking of uh, the State Department and the administration at this time about the role of the Federal Republic of Germany in uh, international affairs? <clears throat> well, of course, as you know, we took the lead in converting Germany from an enemy to a, an ally. Uh, we were in the process of rearming Germany. We, we had uh, relied on Germany in our relations with other European countries. And I think, looking at it broadly, Germany had, had become our single most ally, most important ally in Western Europe. And we intended, of course, to uh, nurture that good relationship and improve it. Uh, there would have been no defense of Europe against the Soviets, which is what we were all concerned with and under NATO, without Germany. Uh, had Germany gone neutral, uh, the, the whole possibility of defending Europe would have been lost. The Germans had an army of about a half million people, and they were stationed on the Soviet border, and all the fighting that would occur if the Soviets ever decided to invade Europe would be through Germany. For Germany was absolutely key to the defense of Europe. Now, meanwhile, in these years, General de Gaulle had become president of France in what? 1958. Uh, did this change the situation, uh, especially in terms of the American uh, attitude toward Germany or concern about Germany and, 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 and the way in which it might uh, go in the direction of, of the Gauls' uh, foreign policy? Well, that's very interesting because <clears throat> I arrived in Bonn to take up my post the day that the German parliament approved the Franco-German treaty. 
And as you know, de Gaulle was very unpopular in our country. He didn't cooperate with us and, and went out of his way to cause trouble, uh, among other things, blocking British entry into the common market, which we very much wanted. Uh, however, uh, we didn't really object to this treaty. Uh, we couldn't really see any danger in these two elderly men who had <laughs> gone through quite similar experiences in the post-war and considered themselves uh, above the other leaders of that time because of their seniority. If they had this sort of uh, love affair at, at the end of their careers, it was a very personal thing. And uh, if, we had not, if, if the French and Germans had not been friendly with each other, for example, we would have been trying very hard to, to make them, to assist them in, in, in a rapprochement or to make them friendly. Uh, Europe has had, had, had uh, uh, three world wars, uh, starting back in 1870, over French-German rivalry. And that has always been the, the greatest danger for war in Europe. And to overcome that uh, uh, was worth a very considerable sacrifice on our part to have to uh, put up with de Gaulle. Uh, I personally, while I was in Bonn, always supported the French-German alliance and told the Germans so. And uh, the French thought we were opposing it. Uh, they thought that we were trying to be a rival with them for <coughs> uh, <coughs> the first position with Germany. But I always assured them that, that we were not. But was there some concern that uh, de Gaulle's um, almost neutralist position in many ways, or at least his denunciation of the two hegemonic powers, the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, might uh, interfere with the kind of support that uh, West Germany was giving to the Western alliance. Well, <clears throat> Adenauer and Earhart subsequently were not going to be taken in by de Gaulle. They, they attached much more value to their relationship with us than they did to de Gaulle. Uh, <clears throat> the Franco-German treaty was very popular in Germany because the Germans wanted to get along with the French and uh, it was popular in France. But our relationship was more important. After all, we were the greatest power, and we were giving them uh, originally Marshall Plan aid, and uh, we had a uh, quarter of a million troops there, which was extremely important. Uh, after all, uh, France was a member of NATO, and at that time, uh, they had still permitted bases to be held in France. It was only later, you know, that we were forced out of France. So at this time, I don't think we were worried about this relationship. I, that's what I told the Germans. Mm -hmm. What were you called upon to do when you first arrived? Was it a matter of uh, <clears throat> mending fences in any way or <laughs> taking care of the concerns of all the Americans who were stationed there? Now, it will amuse you what I had to do. The first thing was the chicken war. <clears throat> uh -oh. Fulbright <clears throat> came from a state that raised chickens. Arkansas. And, and he wanted to sell them to Europe. And when I went, the department said, you've got to do this for, for Fulbright. <laughs> and I had another unfortunate task that I had to do right off, which was rather drawing on the goodwill that I, I wanted to create. And that was to tell them that they couldn't supply a wide diameter pipe for the Russian pipeline. The Monisman Company had a contract for a wide diameter pipe. Uh, and we were determined that this would make Germany and Western Europe unduly dependent on the Soviet Union. It later became NATO policy that no country should have more than a certain percentage of its requirements from the Soviet Union for that reason. And I took a very strong line that management had to cancel this contract. And uh, they didn't like it at all. And later, after they did it, because they, they were really very compliant with our wishes at this time, they told me they had made a mistake and they would never do it again. That's why when this came up under Reagan, you remember, uh, and Reagan asked them to cancel the 
guess why the diameter of the pipe. They refused to do it. Uh, if Reagan had asked me, I would have told him they weren't going to do it that <laughs> time. <laughs> well, I am, in fact, struck by the recurrence of, I mean, the chicken war is just the, the first of many sub European subsidy, European product wars, mm -hmm. and the pipeline wars, again, mm -hmm. this relationship of economic relations between Germany and, and, and the Soviet Union. And I wonder if you think this is endemic and has been an endemic and is likely to remain an endemic characteristic of our relations both with Germany and with Europe more generally. <clears throat> well, the, the um, chicken issue still remains in that we haven't overcome the, the present, the, the uh, uh, tariffs that the common market has mm -hmm. set against the importation of such products. It, it, it's still the issue that's preventing us from finishing the Uruguay Ur right. Ur 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 uh, round. round. <clears throat> On the other hand, we, uh, we don't have the same attitude toward the Soviet Union, so we wouldn't object if the issue came up of making pipe for them. We wouldn't be concerned about any undue dependence on Western Europe on Soviet oil or gas at this juncture. Mm -hmm. Were you um, heavily involved in other economic matters at the time? in Germany? <clears throat> yes. Uh, we had then the uh, Kennedy round of tariff negotiations going on, which were dragging on for a long time. Eventually they were quite successful. Perhaps the one most important negotiation that took place was first the uh, nuclear test ban treaty, mm -hmm. but more important the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and that was a very difficult treaty. The Germans didn't want nuclear weapons. They couldn't have them in the first place. But they wanted to be free to participate in peaceful uses and for their industry to be able to make nuclear plants for power generation or to conduct engineering projects using nuclear power. And the other countries were concerned about Germany getting too close to nuclear matters, and they wanted to have a very uh, rigid inspection through the IAEA in Vienna <coughs> of all nuclear activity. And this uh, negotiation dragged on for a couple of years while we attempted to, to hold Germany and put them under rather strict discipline in their desire to get free. And eventually we, we compromised on many issues with them, and they were the last important country to sign that they signed. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what kind of personal contacts did you have with uh, Chancellor Adenauer? Well, of course, I had many with all the three chancellors of Germany that I uh, dealt with. I was there six months with Adenauer before he retired. And I think in my book I, I cite that I had 89 meetings with, with chancellors of Germany, all of which are reported in my book. But <clears throat> he was a very interesting man. I remember the first meeting I had with him, uh, largely preparing for the Kennedy visit, which happened only a month after I arrived. Uh, he, he, he talked most of the time, but I think the meeting lasted almost three hours. He would have been, what, 87 maybe? <laughs> he just at 90. And mm -hmm. he, he, he was very alert, though, and uh, in good, good form. I had many talks with him. He sometimes was a little naughty and leaking things to the press that were somewhat critical of us. But I worked very hard on keeping good relationship with him, so he would, he would, he would, uh, hold these to a minimum, but he couldn't resist if an important international journalist like Schulzberg came to Bonn to have a conversation with him, and he would tell him sometimes things he objected to that we were doing. As I recall that uh, first visit of Kennedy, there were some tensions about Berlin and Adenauer's role and, and whether he would be able to uh, have appropriate role. Did you, find, did you consider that to be uh, a reflection of his personality or more generally and of his self-esteem or uh, more generally a problem that was recurrent with 
the uh, with the chancellors with respect to the problems of Berlin and and um, and uh, German U.S. Berlin relations. Well, this was an interesting little contretemps. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue was who took precedence, Brandt or Hagenauer. Mm -hmm. uh, Berlin was not legally a part of Germany. Uh, actually, the three ambassadors, British, French, and American, were the government of, of Berlin. We were sovereign, and Brandt reported to us. Uh, Germany, West Germany paid all the bills, and they were treated in many ways like a, another land of Germany. But in fact, they were, they were quite separate. Adenauer uh, is very anti-Berlin. He's a Rhinelander. He never liked Berlin and uh, didn't feel comfortable in Berlin. But he had to go to Berlin to show that it was Germany. But he could not avoid Willy Brandt stealing the show. And Willy Brandt rode in with him in the car. Willy Brandt made the Ischbrunan Berliner speech. Uh, he, he clearly won this battle with, with the old man. Conrad? Yeah. <laughs> Going back to your appointment uh, in, in Bonn, that was a small town on the Rhine in the Carré's phrase. Wasn't that a bit of a come down uh, compared to Washington? And how did you adjust? Oh, not for me. I was very happy. Uh, the last thing in the world I wanted to do was to get into a big city like London, Paris, or Rome, where you have to entertain local people all the time and uh, are caught up in the local social life. There, there was no life like that in Bonn. And we had a large family, and the embassy was a very pleasant family home. We had mm -hmm. seven acres going down to the Rhine, and we had a lovely view of the Siebengebirge Mountains uh, beyond the Rhine, and uh, we were very happy just to, to stay at home. Uh, no one came there unless they had business. In the whole five years I was there, there were only two or three senators that ever came there. <laughs> you get two or three a day in, in London, Paris, and Rome. And uh, the people who came, they came for a real reason. And we had adequate social life. We entertained in our home in five years 16,000 people. And uh, that was quite enough. <laughs> <laughs> Then it wasn't quite as much of a shock to be from the center of power in Washington to something that uh, was getting more important, but still not, you know, anywhere no, near where it is today. No, of course, nothing could be so important as as um, as Washington. And uh, if you're going to be in a foreign country, a country Germany was a country I knew, and 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 I liked the German people. I, I liked Germany, Germany, and uh, I thought it was it was just as important as any foreign mm -hmm. post that we had. Mm -hmm. And uh, five years is a long time, but I assure you, I enjoyed every moment of it. There is a, a lot of uh, sort of rhetoric about the special relationship uh, in quotation marks sometimes, uh, you know, and that, of course, is necessary to sort of bolster alliances uh, on a rhetorical level and to get good feelings going one way or the other. But I think the practice of your work was really concerned with ironing out the difficulties and you know could you you know tell us a few more incidents about things that you saw as particularly contentious and uh, are they the sort of things that you know as Professor Lang was asking before are likely just to sort of crop up unexpectedly or are they embedded in the asymmetry of the relationship because we are so much stronger than they are? That's a very interesting question. I used to analyze this because uh, minor matters would crop up. Mm -hmm. I kept a chart Mm -hmm. And I figured that they came up about once every three months. <laughs> and typically it would come up if some American official had been disrespectful of reunification and issued some statement indicating we didn't take reunification seriously. I'd quickly have to rush in and make clear our policy toward reunification. And uh, that would calm down. And then six months later we would have a quarrel over the offset agreement. Uh, this wasn't a German payment, but the Germans agreed to buy Mm -hmm. arms from us to the value of our foreign exchange loss uh, in <laughs> keeping our troops in Germany. It was, it was a fair deal and uh, it was a budgetary problem for the Germans, but, but uh, not, not a, a payment problem. And uh, sometimes these negotiations get very tough. McNamara conducted many of them. 
and so we'd have bad times. But in, in a few months, that was all gone. Uh, the, 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 these are typical of, of the small things that, that would arise, but they, they in no way endangered our fundamental relationship because that was too important for the Germans and too important for us. Oh, that's a very interesting answer because one can turn the special relationship thing on its head. And there's always also a talk about the current crisis of NATO. I mean, somehow or other, or, or, or there is a sort of a saying that, you know, German-American relationships have never been as bad as now, and a search for a period in which they have been better somehow miraculously. And I think, you know, that's mm -hmm. certainly not right, but it suggests that something else is going on, that it's, the rhetoric isn't to be taken at its face value. Well, we had some major shifts. When Kissinger came in, uh, Earhart had, had gone out quite a lot because of, of our failure to assist him when he couldn't make his payment. Johnson was very tough with him. I had recommended to Johnson that we be more generous and had warned him that, that Earhart might lose his job, which he did. And so it wasn't very popular to be a friend of America if that's the way you're going to be treated. And Kissinger took it a turn to, to go. And for at least six or eight months, uh, our stock went down and Francis went up. It never, it never bothered me because I knew this was a purely temporary affair. I can, uh, I, I would consider, for example, that the current uh, disfavor of Germany mm -hmm. because they didn't seem to more, be more eager to, to pay for the the Gulf War, uh, they did. They have offered to pay 5.3 billion, but uh, our people don't think they were quick enough or uh, forthcoming enough. Uh, this obviously is a very minor matter. <laughs> this is not going to disrupt the relations between two great nations like us. Then in three or four months, uh, we, we will have forgotten all about that. But that, that, that is rather typical of the type of thing I'm describing to you. No, I, I agree, and then sometimes the, the rhetoric of making it into more of a problem, as it seems, is also designed so that you get all the firemen from all directions rushing to pour water on whatever it is that is just beginning to burn somewhere so that the relationship stays fundamentally healthy. That is, of course, one way. One uh, issue that arose was <coughs> Brandt's Ostpolitik. Um, this started really when Brandt was being generous with Christmas passes in Berlin. He had a great flair for him doing things from, for the common people out of humanitarian reasons. He, he's a man of a great heart. And uh, uh, I always supported him. And when he made his beginnings in Ostpolitik, the rapprochement with East Germany, uh, I encouraged him. On the other hand, there were some people in our government who, who were skeptical about it. They used to send people over to, to check up on me to see if I hadn't gone <laughs> overboard with Brent. With Brent. <laughs> I remember Bob Bowie came over for this reason. But uh, uh, basically, we, we supported Ospolti. But that caused some ups and downs when some people thought he was, he was uh, going neutral in, in Berlin. Yeah, one of the ironies was that detente was invented in Washington. And when the Germans finally caught on to it, I mean, initially they resisted it. Mm -hmm. And when they caught on to it and gave it a German word, suddenly it became very suspect. And That's I remember right. Helmut Schmidt being over here, uh, you know, talking to people. He was defense minister at the mm -hmm. time and trying to calm everybody down and saying it's not really as important as you think it is. Well, it made Brandt's career. That's how he got his award. He started with a speech in London uh, on Ostpolitik, and I, I've recorded the development of the policy. Uh, and I think it's contributed greatly to, toward uh, not overcoming the division between East and West Europe, but wholly making it manageable and relieving tension. Uh, do you uh, give uh, your own policy, American policy, also credit for unification? I mean, I know this goes a little bit beyond the time period in which you were over there, but you must have thought about it a great deal when it was happening. Well, uh, this is one policy that we were absolutely consistent with. We backed reunification 100 percent, no equivocation at all. Um, the only conditions were that both countries were free and both countries accepted it and wanted it. Um, and all the other, Europe the other European countries, many of them were having questions about it. But there's absolutely no occasion when, when we ever displayed any question about it. But, but did, uh, did we back it because we thought it was a check that would never be cashed? Or 
uh, mm. for some other reason. I mean, wasn't there some cocktail party chatter that also said, well, you know, let's keep telling mm. this to them so that they are staying in NATO and so on, and they behave, and you know, really, we don't think this is going to happen. Well, see, no one can tell. We, we didn't have to prove anything, because I used to say that, no, we don't do anything about it. It's not up to us to sure. be more German than the Germans. It's up to them to decide. And if they decide, we're backing them. So that left us in the clear. Secretly, maybe some people had that idea. But uh, I assure you that the official visit was very clear. And the Germans, I think, understood this. And I think this is one of the things that cemented good relations with Germany. And you remember how, how solid our government was when reunification finally came. The doubt was being expressed all over Europe and about the reunification, you know, and, and Bush and Baker were absolutely firm. No, I agree. I mean, the, the interview uh, that was uh, given to the New York Times is, is very early. It was already before the wall uh, came down and so on. And, you know, uh, that said, I think, a tone. Um, and I think our government hasn't gotten enough credit for it in Europe. Everybody is looking to mm -hmm. Gorbachev as the person who all mm -hmm. did this. And, uh, uh, you know, they have kind of forgotten about Bush. I came on with Neil Lauer to make this point. Okay, all right. Let me just <laughs> ask one sure. question on, but now the three chancellors, um, Adenauer and Erhard and Kiesinger, uh, the reunification was never on any front burner. It was uh, never high on an agenda, was it, in those days? Well, see, it was high in that everyone wanted it. No one opposed it. And everyone knew there was nothing you could do about it. Yeah. So. If, if, uh, if there's nothing you can do about it, uh, better just leave it on the burner and, and uh, wait, wait your time. Uh, Even Willie Brandt, I think, didn't he once make some statement about, or used a phrase like, one nation but two states? Well, yes. Uh, but see, in theory, it, it, it was always a part of Germany. Uh, their constitution provides for it coming back to Germany. Mm -hmm. And they, they never admitted that this was temporary. Uh, on the other hand, they weren't willing to create a world war in, in order to accomplish it. The, uh, the only thing, there, there was a line of thinking that emerged. Uh, Earhart mentioned it to me, and uh, Springer, the press czar, mentioned it to me, that they would be willing to pay for reunification. And uh, they were banding about very large figures in the tens of billions of dollars. But uh, they never had figured out how it would be accomplished because the Soviet Union obviously wouldn't, couldn't just accept a straight bribe for reunification. But if they went in and helped the Soviets by aiding them economic, economically to the extent of 30 or 40 billion, um, then perhaps the Soviets would relax. Nothing ever came of this, but they used to talk about it. Let, let me um, pick up these two themes that we've been talking about a bit, which is the Franco-German relationship and the Ostpolitik. Uh, to give you a general impression, I had reading your memoir uh, at points where you discuss really your relationship back to Washington. And at, at points it seems that um, there was a certain lack of confidence in Washington and in our ability to control our relationships with the Germans and that each time one of these things came up, like the Franco-German Treaty or the Ostpolitik or somebody making some noise about relations mm -hmm. with Poland or the Soviet Union or perhaps, we somehow didn't have the confidence that, as you've expressed it here, that the underlying structure of the relationship was totally solid and that these were passing moments. And I'm curious whether, first of all, that's an accurate uh, reflection of yours or an accurate reflection of your mm -hmm. reflection. And, and what to what you would attribute that is, uh, you must have thought a bit about, about this because in your, in your memoirs you do discuss it. Well, there were individuals in the government, in, in the periphery of government, <clears throat> who were anti-German and uh, who wanted to block uh, good relations with Germany and, and to guard very carefully against the possibility of Germany going neutral or favoring the communists. Um, but these were very few. Uh, Kissinger was among them. He, he was skeptical about Brandt. Mm -hmm. he, he says so in his memoirs. Mm -hmm. um, there were various people very close to, to the president who were, were 
skeptical about Germany. But these, these were just a few isolated people. I assure you that from the top down, Kennedy, Johnson, Rusk, Ball, myself, there was no, uh, no question. So this wasn't somehow a reflection of the U.S. having only recently become a major international power and somehow not being entirely attuned to, to the sort of the relationship between structure and the, this more temporary fluff of, of relations. Well, I th see, remember, we made up our mind when Jimmy Burns and Stuttgart mm -hmm. said that we forgive Germany, we're going to help, help Germany build her up. Uh, we made the basic decision then. And, and there was no way we could turn back after that. Um, we, we are responsible for, for Germany recovery, German recovery, oh, sure. and the Marshall Plan and, and what McCloy did and people of that era. And th there was no way we could look back once we'd embarked on this course, and no occasion to. But I don't believe the Germans ever gave us any reason to doubt their sincerity and being thoroughly allied with the West is what Adenauer accomplished. He put this over reunification. So you considered the occasional outbreaks of anti-Americanism as a nuisance, <laughs> uh, but not as something that would sort of change the nature of the relationship? I really don't call it anti-Americanism. Maybe some of the students have that view who are very pacifist and against us because we are a military power. Or, we dropped the bomb or something like that, but I don't believe Germans are anti-American. Um, they can't afford to be, or they, rather they couldn't as long as they were threatened by the Soviet Union. Uh, it, 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 it's rather interesting that as a result of the removal of the Soviet threat, our need for Germany has greatly decreased and their need for us has greatly decreased. So there is flexibility in our relationship that didn't exist before. And some people in, who've been to Germany in recent months uh, complain that the Germans are not as cooperative as they used to be, that they act arrogantly and that sort of thing. This never occurred in my time. And I believe it's only in comparison with the relative subservience of the Germans to us. Uh, <laughs> the Germans have always been so cooperative. I can't ever recall my five years there any question of duplicity vis-a-vis -vis us. Any time they misrepresented something or failed to be a good ally, they never liked what we were doing in Vietnam, but they were very polite about it. They, they sent some hospital units there. They gave $15 million. They gave more than any other country. <laughs> if we might focus on, on Vietnam for a second in relationship to being an ambassador in Europe, because clearly until that time, Europe had been very preeminent in, in U.S. foreign policy thinking, and there you arrived in, in Germany, and the, one of the, the, if not the major capital for European diplomacy that we had at the time, and all of a sudden, this war emerges. And I'm, I'm curious about what that did to the role of an ambassador trying to deal with Washington with this growing war, uh, especially during the Johnson period then, um, and in your ability to get your views through to promote American interests within Germany and, that, and, and those kinds of issues? Well, <clears throat> I, I had not been involved in the Vietnamese affair before I left. and It, it, it had not become uh, much of a, of a threat until after I got to Germany. I remember Lodge came there and tried to explain our Vietnamese policy. It's in the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he, he didn't think there was going to be a war. Uh, we'd lost a handful of people, almost nobody. And uh, he, he thought that it would never get out of line. And Earhart probed him on this, and, and he assured him. The German view is that it was a foolish thing for us to do. One thing may be that <coughs> what we put into that effort was a subtraction, perhaps, of what we could do for Germany and Europe. But, but I thought they, they just thought it was an unwise decision. And, and they hated to see us make a, make a mistake like that, but they never said that. Uh, it was so unpopular, it was very difficult for Germany to help us overtly. And they always had this good case, uh, it's in the Constitution, they can't do it. And uh, Earhart tried to be as forthcoming as he could and ultimately gave $15 million. 
uh, and sent hospital troops, but it didn't amount to very much. And Thompson resented the fact that he didn't do more. Uh, but it appears the American line used to be that if we don't uh, defend Vietnam, uh, Germany and Western Europe don't think we'll ca we will carry out our obligation mm -hmm. to defend them. <laughs> that wasn't their reaction. <laughs> We didn't have to prove anything in, in, in Vietnam. They trusted us to carry out our obligations to them. Uh, you knew Dean Rusk very well. Um, did he find himself uh, caught up by the circumstances of that war? Did he ever have any way of checking this kind of continuing involvement, deepening involvement? Well, Dean is a very close friend. and. I worked directly with him in the early days when we were both fellow assistant secretaries of state and then he became under secretary of state over me and then I came back in with him uh, when he became secretary of state and for a long time the hierarchy in the department was Russ, Ball and McGee, that was the line. So we, 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 we've very, been very closely associated. I'm, I'm very fond of him, really admire of his. He is a, he's built like a rock. You can't shake him. He, he's a, a man who's absolutely uh, does what he's supposed to do and what he thinks he has to do. And he's not going to get excited or nervous or question what he's doing, if, if he believes it's right. Uh, he's not the sort of man that, that would uh, have, have uh, hesitancies and doubts or, or uh, physical breakdowns or anything like that. He's a strong man. It's not clear what his initial attitude toward the war was. And he, will, he would never, ever have said that he opposed the war. And once the war started, he loyally supported the president in pursuit of two presidents in, in pursuit of winning the war. He wouldn't write his own memoir for this reason. Mm -hmm. He has lately, through his son, written mm -hmm. a book. Uh, he, he would never draw any line between himself and the president. Mm -hmm. If we could <clears throat> turn a bit to domestic German politics, because, uh, of course, this was a period of uh, the first real substantial change in domestic German politics uh, with the entry of the Grosse Coalition and then really by the time you were leaving it was pretty evident that there was going to be perhaps a further shift. Now um, as ambassador, um, how were you able to interact with this domestic situation given that on the one hand we were very uh, closely allied with the Germans and had played this sort of dominant role as you said they had been subservient but now they were beginning to change domestically in ways that perhaps we were not sure we always were comfortable with. Well, of course, <clears throat> uh, we deal with the government, but we, uh, it's our policy to keep contact with and close relations with the opposition. And actually, the opposition was not very much against the policies we stood for. Uh, for example, they, they supported NATO. Uh, they, they believed in the market system. Uh, no one in Germany has ever been socialistic. No one's ever proposed a, a social re <coughs> socialist regime. My contacts originally were with Erler, who was the spokesman for the SPD, and I had known Erler for a long time through the Bilderberg Group. He was he and I were both members of Prince Bernhardt's Bilderberg Group, and I kept in constant contact with him until his death. And. After that, I found others that I could keep in contact with. So we had good relations with the, the SPD. And naturally, when, when you're associated with one party for a long time, there's a tendency to seem to feel that you're partial to that party. I mean, you, you have to deal with the, the government. You have no choice. And there had been no socialist government, of course, at all. Uh, the Grand Coalition came because of the great weakness of the CDU and the withdrawal of the FDP, which meant they couldn't rule, and they had to have this Grand Coalition. 
but they got along quite well. I, I described that in the book, and I, I don't see that, that we had any great difficulty in getting along with Brandt as well as with Kissinger. But um, Brandt was a different type of person than these than these other politicians, wasn't he? I mean, yes, uh, Brandt was an enigma, really. He he was a, a charming fellow, he, that winsome smile of his. And he was a great favorite with Americans. The Kennedys liked him very much. They invited him up to the second floor of the White House when he was there. But you couldn't really predict him. He, I don't think you ever, no one ever really thoroughly understood him. Um, every question of, of his being duplicitous, or, uh, not loyal to, to relations with us, he, he obviously was more to the left. And, he had followers who were quite quite a lot more to the left. There were two or three of them that really concerned us. But <clears throat> he did such a good job as mayor of Berlin that uh, we uh, supported what he was doing. Had very good relationships with him. Go ahead. Uh, but didn't you sense that in the Vietnam War, the rel quality of the relationship changed somewhat between uh, the United States and Germany? My recollection is that before, in the Adenauer years and with Erhard still, there was a kind of uh, unquestioning admiration. And it was in some ways even the star pupil syndrome, that is, the Germans wanted to be better than the Americans and more Amer American than the Americans. And somehow, um, you know, something happened in that then because it's like finding out that one's parents uh, make mistakes or are only human mm -hmm. or whatever, and that I think led to some kind of redefinition in it. And I wonder, you know, what your feelings were. Well, I tell you, the, the biggest change occurred when Earhart was defeated. Um, Earhart had been very friendly with us, cooperated completely. He threw himself on on Johnson's mercy, and Johnson let him down. I wrote Johnson the memo before he visited, saying that we must be generous with him. He's in bad shape, and if we press him too hard, he may may lose his job. And McNamara was running the show on the offset issue, and they were relentless with uh, with Earhart. And he was a beaten man when he left Washington, and he went home, and in two weeks he was gone. And that sort of gave the impression to the Germans that you don't gain anything by being friends with America. When Kissinger came in, he took a turn toward the French, uh, in a sense to show independence from America, and uh, because he, he sincerely believed in the rapprochement with the French. But gradually, uh, he came back around. Uh, he had a hard time getting along with Johnson. They couldn't arrange a meeting, and uh, there was misunderstanding between them. People would, Germans would be very naughty. They would go to, to uh, Washington and talk with people. I think they exaggerated chance remarks and come back and report, oh, Johnson thinks you're giving us away, everything away <laughs> to the communists. And, uh, the bad feeling between those two was very great, but that eventually was overcome. He, he came eventually, and they had a good visit. Come back and to a, another point that's related to this. Um, you say, well, when when Jimmy Burns made his speech, every everybody knew that from then on the Second World War was over, and things were going to take a different turn. We were going to have very friendly <coughs> relations with the Federal Republic, but. Um, when, when you study history and recent history in the Second World War, wasn't it an amazing thing that uh, our generation was able to forget the, the, the Holocaust, for example, what Germany had accepted? I won't say the Germans all participated in it wholeheartedly, mm -hmm. but they had accepted a, a really horrible dictatorship. Now, I suppose my question is, and then as recently as during your ambassadorship, when Kissinger becomes chancellor, he himself had at least nominally been a member of the Nazi party. It was so hard to believe that all of this was just being swept under the rug in a sense, or maybe just it was an honest and sensible kind of rational decision. And I, I think in some ways, to come back to Billy Brandt, didn't he 
represent uh, something of a conscience of uh, Germany, sort of remembering what had happened and his famous visit to Warsaw in which he pays homage to the victims of the Holocaust. How, were you, you must have been aware of all this and sensitive well, to it. <clears throat> I'd been in Germany a great deal before the war, first in 1930, when the, when the communists were, were first starting to make their move. And I was there after the war. But I was in the Pacific in the Navy during the war, so I never came in contact with Nazis or, or the European war. And when I got to Germany, the people I dealt with were people who had been very carefully vetted for their uh, Nazi uh, sympathies or, or participation. So I never dealt with anyone who hadn't been anti-Nazi. Uh, if they were young enough, they might have been in the German army, but they'd been in the private or something like that. Karsten, I think, was one, one of those. But none of those people could have had any Nazi record, or they wouldn't have, be, have been there. Same is true with all the people in, in leading positions in business. So I, I was dealing with people who were either too young, or they, they were clearly uh, blameless as so far as support of, of Nazism. So it's pretty hard for me to hold this against people who were not involved or, and how you can persist in holding guilt against the whole country. It's just not practical. You have to move on and get ready for the next war. <laughs> you, can't, you can't keep harboring these resentments forever. I think this is very understandable, but we weren't other things coming out, didn't uh, Bill Shirer's uh, Horizon and Fall of the Third Reich you know, appear right about then and get enormous sales, number one on the bestseller list and so on, so that you know, American intellectuals and some other kinds of groups who were not necessarily in the government uh, in the United States or people with whom you had direct contacts in Germany uh, were, were still concerned with some of this earlier nasty business and you know, didn't these things interfere on occasion on some level in the relationship anyway? Well, you know how Americans in general feel about this. I know a few people who would never go to Germany for any reason and would never forgive the Germans. I can count them on my two hands compared with the people who accept Germany as an ally and have confidence in Germany. The, the, the Americans who don't, who don't forgive and forget are very few. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. No. And, and I honestly think that you, you have to get on. We did it with Japan, after all. I mean, uh, they forgive us for burning 150,000 people that night in, in Tokyo. We forgive them for taking Pearl Harbor, and we have a very good relationship with them. One issue we haven't uh, discussed too much we, uh, is the uh, emergence of the European economic community in this period and, and Germany's role there. Um, at the outset, uh, some people have argued that the community was in part one, one effort of the Europeans to, in a sense, create ties with Germany that would bind it in so heavily into Europe that it would be uh, impossible for them ever to, to move off on their own. But gradually in the 60s, Germany began to become more of a force within the community itself. And uh, I was wondering how the embassy reacted to these things. And, and I know there were tensions about even about the community and whether that was a good or bad thing, although those became more strong in the 70s. By, my, by the time I got to Germany, <coughs> our fundamental policy was to support the community, including the enlargement to include England, mm -hmm. <coughs> and for the community to uh, make progress in getting more into political and economic matters. And uh, we would have welcomed political unity at that time. It's rather amusing that when they come now for full economic unity in mm -hmm. next year, the Americans are getting worried that they're doing this for some ulterior reason. We forced them to do it. We, we were pushing them all during this time. Half my conversations were to get the Germans to support European unity, to support more uh, unity in economic matters. This was our policy. What was the rationale for that policy? Basically, that, that uh, uh, a united Europe would be a stronger Europe and a bastion against the Soviet Union. So it was largely in a Cold War context that we saw it. Everything. 
The Cold War dominated everything in this era. I think it dominated policy all over the world, much more than, than we realized. Everything we did, and I, I spent 40 mm -hmm. years as in the Cold War. Well, let, me, let me pick up on the Cold War, because we haven't mentioned a name, and I'm very interested in getting your reaction. George Kennan. You must have thought a great deal about uh, Kennan's role in developing the containment policy, and then how it seemed to have worked out in practice. I know he wasn't completely happy with the way people interpreted some of his ideas. Well, he pretty well disavowed it. Yeah. And it's rather interesting. Uh, most people would give him credit for the Truman Doctrine. In his last article in Foreign Affairs, he, he disavowed that he had ever intended anything to happen like the Truman Doctrine. Uh, the containment policy was de facto, I mean, the Greek Turkish aid was, was containment. <laughs> Nobody had ever put it in the same wordage that Kenan used, but everything we did was containment. Uh, when I was out through South Asia, trying to persuade these people not to be neutralists, to arm themselves and be prepared when the Soviets came. Everything, everything I did, the aid we gave, everything was containment of the Cold War. I think we were interested in Africa almost entirely because of the Cold War. We were in the Congo because we were afraid the Soviets were going to get it. Now, did he feel, though, that some people had interpreted it uh, too much in a military sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, he, 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 uh, he says that he was interpreting it in a, a political, ideological sense, and uh, he, uh, he also says that we shouldn't support weak countries, we should support only strong countries, and here the first two countries we supported were Greece and Turkey, very Turkey. weak countries. Huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, though it, it, it's funny that, that George gets credit you know, for people who think are good policies, uh, policies which he himself has renounced. You read that, that article in the Foreign Affairs, Foreign Affairs again where he second guesses the containment policy and all the ensuing policies. You, you still respect him, though, for his contributions to thinking about these matters in that way, do you? Or how, what is your reaction to George well, Kennan? Well, George Kennan is a complicated man. He opposed the NATO. Uh, he, he lost his job in Russia. <laughs> I'll let history judge George Kennan. Mm -hmm. If I could... Um focus a bit on, uh, on personalities. One of the things you mention in your book is that with the passing of Adenauer, there was a passing of generations uh, of leadership, not only in Germany, but really in Europe, uh, de Gaulle being the last one who still remained uh, in place. And I was wondering if you might tell us a little bit about what your perceptions were as ambassador about the differences between these two generations. Well, because Earhart was not far from his generation. He wasn't the, the next generation. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there was great enmity to Adenauer and Earhart. Adenauer t tried to block him from being chancellor in every way he could. And in a sense, help, helped uh, bring him down eventually. I think you, you'd have to go to Karsten's uh, a real next generation among the leaders that were coming up uh, to, to get the generational difference. You speak very highly of Carson's in your in your memoir, both of Carson's and Schroeder. So, did you I've did never, you find it easier to work with that generation of Germans? Well, Carson's as an individual is, is mm -hmm. unique. He, he went to Yale. He speaks perfect English. He, he's a perfect gentleman. Uh, he was Under Secretary of State. I'd known him a long time. Through. I remember when I became Under Secretary of State, he was Under Secretary of State, and he mm -hmm. sent me a, a telegram congratulating me. 
especially when I was in Bastia, I, about half of my business was with him, which was very easy to do. All Americans liked him. What about in general? I mean, one something that some people have said is that the the younger generation of Germans is more direct, less marked by the sort of 19th century idealist German culture. That's Conrad. I think that's a correct way of putting it. Um, uh, and that they were easier for Americans to deal with because they were a, a sort of more direct, not really more well, Americanized, but... Because uh, Adenauer is the best example of the older generation. He goes back so far that mm -hmm. nobody went back that far. So right. he's in a class by himself. Kissinger, say, is a, was the correct generation level, I think, that you're speaking of, mm -hmm. and Earhart. <coughs> and they were ba ba basically post-war people. They were made after the war. And uh, was made before mm -hmm. the war. Uh, so he, he dips deeper into that, that his history. But take uh, Bar Bartzel, take uh, Strauss, these are other people who are clearly a generational change. And their individuality almost exceeds though their, what, what they might have in common as being mm -hmm. a member of that generation. Well, we have about a minute to go. Is, um, I, th I think I'll take my leaf from Bruce's last question for you. Are there is there a major triumph you saw from your period as ambassador and look with hindsight and perhaps something you feel less secure in having succeeded in? <coughs> Non-proliferation treaty. That, that was the most important thing that happened generally in that era. And the Germany was the hardest to get in and we got Germany in. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, just to hold relations on the general tenor, to, tenor of a very high level, despite these Three months ups and downs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and any anything you, in hindsight, think you might have done more effectively? No, I honestly can't. Uh, there's no way we could have pushed reunification. We pushed as hard as we could for uh, development of NATO economically and politically. I think we pushed them a little too hard on the offset. I, I wouldn't have pushed them so hard. I wouldn't have pressed Earhart to the point he lost his job. But these are ups and downs. These are not fundamental things. You know, basically, those five years, the, the relationship was very strong, and I think it still is. Well, Ambassador McGee, thank you very much. I think we've all thank enjoyed you. it. You're very thank good you, Conrad Yarosh and Joel Colt.